Local historians and storytellers from the Bally Castle area have been known to recount, upon occasion, a charming tale set in the 17th century, centering on Bunamargi Friary. The Franciscans established the friary in the 1490s for their lordship Rory McQuillan in a joint attempt to Christianize the lands to the east of the Margie River. Anyway, more interestingly, the Franciscans ensured notoriety for the friary as it was only one of a few that was open to both men and women wishing to take refuge in their faith and to spend their life in prayer and devotion. The following were the original rules framed by St. Francis for admission to his order. One, restoration of unjustly got goods. Two, reconciliation with enemies. Three, observance of the commandments of God, the precepts of the church and the rule. Four, in the case of a married woman, her husband's consent. In this time-honored tradition, it is said that Julia McQuillan, known as the Black Nun of Bunamargi, lived within the friary. In fact, in the year 1810, some 150 years after her death, Robert Stewart of Ballet Castle wrote of her, she lived in the most austere manner and in the constant exercise of devotion. Independent of a just notion of revealed religion, she appears to have possessed a wonderful knowledge of future events and to have been enlightened by a ray of intellect more than human. On the surface, her many predictions seemed improbable. Some thought them the wandering of an enthusiastic mind. This said, some have been verified. For example, she predicted that two standing stones, one at Carn Duff and the other at Barnish, would become united. Sure enough, the prophecy was fulfilled during the erection of the old harbour, where the two stones were placed alongside each other in one of the piers. Julia was rigid in her religious duties, spending many hours praying on her own as a recluse away from others within the friary. Tradition says she had a sister whom she had occasion to blame for some impropriety. Even though her sister had shown ample contrition in the view of others, Julia was unmoved and didn't afford her sister true forgiveness. One wintry night, a particularly harsh and miserable one, Julia's sister, suffering the cold and damp through, requested assistance and a stay of comfort with her at the friary. Julia, due to Christian motives, could not deny her sister's request, so, she led her to a small cell and made her comfortable. Determined not to acquiesce to what she saw as her own sister's undisciplined, unchristian ways, she went out into the grounds to pay her devotions in the open air. After some time, Julia looked around towards her cell and saw a most magnificent light. Astounded by its sheer brilliance and knowing that no fire had burned there for many months, she returned to the cell. As she entered, she watched the amazing glow as it receded from where her sister lay. She moved forward gently to her sister's side and arrived just in time to hear her sister sigh her last breath, which was in praise to her Redeemer. She considered events and decided this to be a sign of heaven's forgiveness of her sister and a sign for Julia to become more forgiving of all human frailty in a less structured worship of the Lord's work. On her own deathbed, Julia requested to be buried near to the entrance of the chapel, and such that all those entering for worship would tread on her grave, this as a gesture of her humility, forgiveness and contriteness of spirit. A stone cross, pierced with a circular hole, is said to mark her grave. The cross is located close to the gable of the most western wall, 